Hi, we're going to continue on with black holes. So, I'll start. Black holes are the largest collections of pure, violent energy in the universe. If you come too close, they'll devour you and add your energy to their collection. And so, the energy is lost to us forever. Or is it? It turns out there's a universe cheat code. A way of powering civilizations until the very death of everything, or of constructing the largest bomb in the universe. But how? Didn't we learn that all energy is trapped forever in black holes, even light? This is true. Everything you think you know about the weirdest thing in the universe is about to get weirder for one simple reason. Black holes are spinning. That first visual perfectly went with the article we talked about last time comparing black holes to Pac-Man. Just consuming or colliding with other black holes and gobbling up planets and stars, increasing in size as they do. I just picture them out there being a menace. Why black holes spin? Doesn't everything spin? When really, really massive stars die, their cores collapse under their own gravity into black holes. This means something very big becomes very, very tiny. Like the tiniest anything can be in this universe. But stars are rotating, and a fundamental property of our universe is that things that are spinning don't want to stop spinning. We call this angular momentum. And this angular momentum can't go away. A big thing that spins and becomes smaller spins faster. So, as the core of a star collapses, its momentum makes it spin faster and faster and faster until it collapses into a black hole. And I was deep into this Isaac Arthur rabbit hole, but in one of his videos, he was comparing how a figure skater with her arms out skates slower than one who brings the arms in to angular momentum. Actually, his whole series is really good. It's called Civilizations uh, at the End of Time, I believe. He doesn't have visuals like these videos, so it's good to have on in the background. I will add it for you. Black hole keeps on spinning, inconceivably fast. Some of them spin millions of times a second. Why spinning black holes are special. Just like non-spinning black holes, spinning black holes have an event horizon and a singularity at their core where all of their mass is concentrated. Okay, so maybe not everything is spinning. The singularity is usually described as a single, infinitely small point with no surface area. But points can't rotate, so a rotating singularity can't be a point. Instead, it's a ringularity. A ringularity is a ring with a thickness of zero and no surface, spinning extremely fast, containing all the mass of the black hole. The black hole is spinning so fast that it morphs space and time itself. It literally drags space with it, such as its power. This creates a new and super weird region of space-time, the ergosphere, which envelops the black hole. If space and time are completely broken inside the event horizon, then they're only half broken inside the ergosphere. Inside the ergosphere, nothing makes sense. It's possible to enter it and then leave it again, but it's probably not a great experience. You can imagine it like this. Falling into a static black hole is like sliding down a hole. Being inside the ergosphere of a spinning black hole is like spiraling down a deadly drain. Nightmare. The black hole transfers its own kinetic energy in the form of rotation to everything that enters the ergosphere. The ringularity makes you dance whether you want to or not. You need to move faster than the speed of light just to stand still here, which is impossible. But here's our cheat code. We can steal this energy. And there's a lot of energy to steal. How to steal energy from a monster. Sounds like the title of the novel. Take the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. We could steal as much energy from it as every single star in the Milky Way emits in a billion years combined. The easiest way to steal this energy is, oddly enough, to drop something into the black hole. We've seen that the ringularity forces energy on us when we enter the ergosphere, which is a lot like being in a whirlpool with space-time rushing around and around. If you're clever, you can use the water to your advantage and swim faster than before. 
In practice, this means sending a rocket into the ergosphere and making a trade with the black hole. We give it some mass energy, and it gives us some of its rotational energy. Have you ever been caught in a riptide and you want to get back to shore, but that's against the tide? So you just kind of let yourself go and hope and contemplate your life. That's what that just reminded me of. <laughs> Stressful memory. But it's not a fair trade. We get the better deal. Normally, if you fire a rocket, you exchange chemical energy for kinetic energy. This is like pushing yourself forward in a swimming pool. But if you fire a rocket inside the ergosphere, it's like pushing yourself forward in a wave pool. The rotational energy of the waves gives you a much stronger boost than you could get just by pushing yourself. The boost from the rotation of the black hole is so big that you leave the ergosphere with much more energy than you entered it. The black hole gives a tiny amount of its rotational energy to you and slows down a little. Obviously, this requires a lot of food. Fortunately, black holes aren't picky eaters. An advanced future civilization would probably harvest asteroids to drop them into the black hole when they needed an energy boost. But there's an even better way to get energy from a black hole, and oddly enough, it builds the biggest bomb any living thing could ever hope to build. The black hole bomb. We only need two things to build a black hole bomb, a fast spinning black hole and a big mirror. The mirror has to completely envelop the black hole, which is similar to a Dyson sphere, a megastructure that harvests the energy of an entire star. Although our mirror would be easier to build, Mirrors are simpler, and black holes are much, much more compact than stars. If we made the mirror 10 centimeters thick, the metal of a big asteroid would probably be enough material for a black hole with the mass of our sun. Once our mirror is in place, we only need to open a window and shoot electromagnetic waves at the black hole. You can imagine what happens next by imagining tossing a ball at a wall and it coming back faster than a bullet. The waves hit the black hole at light speed. A small proportion of the waves falls past the event horizon to disappear forever. But a much larger amount sloshes through the ergosphere, where the black hole forces some of its rotational energy on them and amplifies them. They I like learning about theoretical physics, but the mirror enveloping the black hole is really pushing my belief in the human capability element. But I guess it's not impossible that we have that type of technology in the far, far off future. Could you imagine having that job in the unforeseeable future? Not being the scientist or the company that creates the mirror, but the astronaut that has to go out there? Not something we have to worry about in our lifetime, thankfully. You now begin super radiant scattering which are fancy science words, meaning bouncing around between mirror and black hole and getting stronger. Every time they go around, they are getting exponentially stronger. By opening some windows in the mirror, we can extract the energy from the waves as fast as they grow, which we could use, in theory, to create what would be, for all practical purposes, an endless source of energy for trillions of years. Or we could blow it up. If the waves are not released, they will continue to get stronger and stronger and take more and more energy from the black hole until the mirror shatters. A supermassive black hole would release as much energy as a supernova, making the bomb the largest explosion any living being could ever create. The last home in a dying universe. The beauty of the black hole bomb, the Penrose process, and the super radiant scattering is that they are not science fiction. In the far, far future, this might be the only way to survive in our dying universe. After all the red dwarfs have cooled down and all the white dwarfs transformed into black dwarfs, the universe will turn dark forever. Rotating black holes might be the only sources of energy in the entire universe that life could harvest. If so, the last living being in existence might one day end its life around a black hole, which is equally chilling and uplifting. It turns out that even without any light, there are places we can go. They always figure out a way to end these existential dread-inducing videos on a light note, which I appreciate. But I'll make sure to link the Kurzgesagt Sag channel down below, along with this specific video. Every time we watch one from them, I end up spending 
way too long afterwards researching whatever they were talking about. I'm just like, what does Brian Cox think about this? That's actually how I found Isaac Arthur. Only to watch another video from them. They bring up a concept that I wasn't familiar with and then I have to do the whole thing over again. But this video is a bit older. If you want to update any of the information they gave, please feel free to do that. The next thing I want to look into is the Dyson Sphere. So if you know of a video on that, please let me know. I'll leave your thoughts and theories on this one. And we'll go on to the books. Instead of recommending a book to you, and this is definitely because I'm pretty sure I've recommended all the books I've read, anything near this subject at this point, Brian Cox, Carl Sagan, that's all I've got. I'm going to ask you for a recommendation because I said in a previous video, actually a long time ago now, that I don't really like science fiction as a genre. And I have read a lot of science fiction to come to that conclusion from Ray Bradbury to Books on the Fermi Paradox, We by Evgeny Zamyatin. Some say that's the first science fiction book ever written, but maybe I'm just not reading the right books. And don't get me wrong, a lot of those that I mentioned were so well written. I just wasn't really pulled into the genre. It didn't make me want to go buy more. So maybe you know of a book that you could suggest to me that got you into reading science fiction. If you can think of one, please tell me the title and I will check it out. All right, we're going to go with space related songs today. And the first one, I don't know how I haven't mentioned before, because it seems like an easy choice. Intergalactic by the Beastie Boys. 90s hip hop, they're from New York City. Paul Revere is another track of theirs that I like. Somewhat history related, although the lyrics aren't really. So that's the first one. Also, Black Star by Radiohead. Not my favorite of theirs, but the title is perfect for the theme. I like the Kid A album better. This one is from their album called The Bend. High and Dry is also on this album, but it's another one that's a bit slower than the songs I typically recommend. So I'll make up for that with the last song recommendation, Andromeda by Gorillaz. It's one of their lesser known tracks, but they usually fall into the alternative genre, trip hop, lo-fi. I don't know the name of this album, but if you can think of any other space related songs, please tell me, I'll check them out. That's really all I have for you today. So thank you for watching with me. Leave your thoughts and I'll catch you in the next.